Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Dom. I am an alcoholic. <laughs> Love it. And through the grace of God and people like you, in fact, people just like you, uh, in a lot of rooms around the country, I've not found it necessary to have a drink now since uh, July 1st, 1975. And for that, I'm And I only came for a couple of weeks. <laughs> you know, just one of those deals. And uh, But I am glad to be sober, and I want to thank the committee for asking us. Uh, we ran across John and Cindy up in Eau Claire last, last year speaking up in Clancy Country, and... Uh, uh, and we just sort of struck up a kinship and a fellowship as we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, John said, I gotta get you out to Beartooth. I said, I'm sorry, right, I'll get you to Texas someday. And we talked, and before we know it, well, here I am. And Precious, you gave a great talk. You really did. And I want to thank you for that. <laughs> the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous happens one more time in Alcoholics Anonymous, as always. And, uh, the magic is, I think what keeps us coming back here, basically. I mean, it does for me. Uh, it's always fun and exciting to be a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. And um, I don't know, uh, this is sort of full circle for me in a couple ways. Uh, number one, uh, my sponsor was uh, Bob And some of you may have heard of Bob Some of you may not have heard of Bob But Bob was a gentleman who lived in Lake Whitney, Texas, and, and that's where I was sentenced to in my fourth year of sobriety because life didn't work on my terms. And, uh, and, and Bob took me under his wing and uh, taught me how to live sober, you know. I had sobriety. I just didn't know how to live sober, you know. And, and so that was a lesson that I had to learn. There's a distinct difference between being sober and living sober, you know. And uh, uh, Bob... Uh, went to speak at a conference up in Virginia, Blackstone, Virginia. Some of you all probably have heard of Blackstone. Uh, I've had the honor to go up there and speak at Blackstone. Blackstone, by the way, is one of the first camp conferences that was ever in the United States in Alcoholics Anonymous. And Bob liked that idea so well that he came back and they started a conference called Cedar Glen. And out of Cedar Glen in Texas, uh, another conference came up called the Brownwood Conference out at Lakeside. And so the Lakeside Conference was the next camp conference to hit Texas. And I've had the privilege of attending that Lakeside Conference. And then out of the Lakeside Conference, another conference was born. It was called the Brazos Riverside Conference. And that's in the third week in October. And we invite each and one, every one of you to come down. Uh, we have some People you probably don't know, but John and Cindy are going to be our speakers down there, you know, and so we invite you to come down and support them in that effort, you know, at the Brazos Riverside Conference. And then out of the Brazos Riverside Conference, there was another guy called Little Jimmy Lee, you know, and Little Jimmy Lee decided he would start a conference with a bunch of guys up in Oklahoma, and they came down and said, Bob, how do we do this? And Bob said, oh, we tell, we'll show you, and so... Bob went up to the Canyon Conference, and the Canyon Conference was born, and then out of the Canyon Conference comes the Beartooth Mountain Conference. So that's full circle. You know, I've been to the granddaddy of them all and talk, and I've been to the latest one on the board and talk, and I will tell you that uh, Alcoholics Anonymous is alive and well. And what you, what you enjoy in the fellowship here and you participate in this type of conference is you get to know each other on an intimate level. Because you're not just in a hotel room where you go in five different directions. You gotta eat together, sleep together, toot together, do the whole deal, you know. <laughs> Full circles. Y'all have been very kind to Karen and I, and we've enjoyed our host Eddie and, and, um, and Clee back there. Where's old Clee? Put your hand up, Clee. Stand up, Clee. Sit down, Clee. <laughs> Clee's well into his third month of sobriety, and we're teaching him about being of service this weekend, and uh, he's learning, you know. And uh, we almost we put him in the back back of the suburban so he couldn't climb out when we went by the roadkill place up here on the way in. <laughs> but I think Clee's got a chance, you know. Uh, Eddie said that it's uh, 
uh, taught him how to get back in the book and work the program, you know. Uh, when somebody asks you to sponsor him, you got to go to work again. Oh, so you got to go back and learn about that textbook, and that's really a neat deal. And uh, we got here last night, and I got into my room, and some good-looking blonde just charged right into my room. I thought, boy, it's a deal, you know. And she said, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so, and she apologized before I even knew what she did, you know. And uh, she said, I've short-sheeted your bed, and I thought it was John's bed instead of your bed. And... <laughs> She said, but you can't tell John until tomorrow, you know. <laughs> so I said, John, this morning, I said, how's your bed? He said, oh, it's short, you know. <laughs> then last night when everybody was asleep at 1130 at night, I get a knock at the door, you know, and I thought, God, I don't remember leaving a wake-up call at 1130, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> Lady said the door said, Open the door, it's Diane, you know. <laughs> and I thought, Well, this is sure a welcome committee. I had Eric and I got Diane at the door, you know, and I said, Well, what do you want? She said, I got your earplugs. <laughs> so I got up and, and I sleep just like I was born, you know, right out of the chute. You know, and I got up and put something on me and I went to the door and opened up the door and she said, Oh my god, you're the wrong person. <laughs> She said, I thought this was John's room, you know. <laughs> so I don't know, Cindy. I'm a little worried about John. He's got all these. <laughs> I mean, I've, I know that being of service, but that sort of takes cake. <laughs> uh, now, the message out of that is when you travel, always ask for John's room. <laughs> drink enough to get here. <laughs> yeah, I stood the high cost of low living just all I could stand, you know. And, uh, <laughs> I was a traveling drunk, you know. I drank and travel. And I remember in one job I had, I used to travel the Southwest and uh, lived in Dallas, and I traveled Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, and that was part of my territory, and I'd get drunk in different places around there, and, and there were five of us guys in the, in the clothing business, and we all maintained an apartment down in New Orleans, you know, and uh, I woke up one morning, and uh, my keys to my car was gone, and my wallet was gone, and and, uh, and my watch was gone, and, uh, and my hemorrhoids were gone, and I didn't know until last night who to thank. I want to thank you, Sandy, for that talk last night. They say if you wait in AA long enough, everything comes around, you know. <laughs> Not really, but I understand that. I took my first drink of alcohol when I was 14. Uh, I'd have took it at 13 if somebody would offered it. You know, I was ready. You know, I, I could have taken it just as early as they'd have given to me, and uh, uh, it really wasn't a great experience for me. You know, you hear speakers get up here and they talk about the great change that took place, and they became a man amongst men, and they were eight foot tall, and you know, or good looking and blonde, or whatever their deal was. And I threw up is what I did. I puked you know, <laughs> because I hung out with the older guys, and they said, "You want to drink?" I said, "Hell yeah, I want to drink." They said, "Well." Do you have any money? I said, well, I got money. How much does it cost? And he said, 20 bucks. And I said, I can get 20 bucks together. And I was always, you know, always trying, I always had some money because I was always making money doing stuff. I was always one of those guys. So they said, bring, we'll pick you up on Friday, bring your $20, and we'll go out and party and chase women. I said, bye, God, that's what I wanted to do, you know. And I had never wanted to do it till they asked me, you know. <laughs> but it seemed like, that women deal was just about to take over in my life, you know, and and so we went out and uh, they got a hold of this little old wine old guy and he went in the store and came back and each one of us had a pint of old crow whiskey, you know, and we had a Coca Cola and uh, had a cup of ice, you know, and so we all got in the car and they all looked at each other and they said, "You know what to do, don't you?" I said, "Yeah, I know what to do. I've done this a lot, you know." <laughs> I mean. You can't ever let them know what you don't know. I mean, you know, I don't care. And I had that problem all my life. You know, you just sort of kept faking it to make it. You know, we would hear that in AA. Well, I'd, pff, wasn't nothing new to me. I faked it all my life, you know. And the guy sat there and they sort of looked at me in a circle and they said, now you know that if you drink that real slow or real fast and hold your nose that it won't burn. I said, I know that, you know. 
And then they watched me, and I guess because maybe I got the $20 that they decided I'd take the first drink. And I drank that pint of whiskey in about 23 minutes. And I don't recommend that for your first drunk, you know, uh, <laughs> because you get deathly ill and you get sick is what you do. And uh, it seemed like they just driving around in circles, and I had my head out the window bouncing against the fender well. And I'll never forget, it was a 1956 Plymouth Fury, and I was throwing spots all over that gold flame going out the back. <laughs> And then they didn't know what to do with me, which was well, not, you know, that, that particular experience would happen a lot in my life where they said, what are we going to do with him? What are we going to do with him? What are we going to do with him? You know, where are we going to put him? Where is he going to go? Can I, how do we get him out of town? You know, and they didn't know what to do with me. And so they decided they'd sober me up. So they took another $5 out of my pocket and went out and bought a whole bunch of black coffee. And uh, they'd pour down a cup of coffee and I'd pour it up. And they'd pour it down and they'd pour it up. <clears throat> And we did that for five dollars worth of coffee, you know. And then they took me home and they stood me between the front door and the door and leaned me in and rang the bell and left, you know. <laughs> and my mother came to the door and I went, boom, just fell right in the living room floor. And on the way down, I yelled, I've been food poisoned, you know. <laughs> and my dad said, the SOB's drunk. So he hauled me down the end of the hall, threw me in the bathtub, ran the shower on me, and took $20 out of my wallet and left me a note next day and said, I only charge you 20 to clean you up this time. Be 50 next time, you know. <laughs> so if you can't drink like a man, don't drink, you know. And for some reason, that sick feeling and all that nonsense that I went through and got that sick that night, that made me feel like a big man. You know, I felt like, well, I'm a Maloney finally, you know, because Maloney's always got drunk on Friday or Saturday. That was just part of the deal. And usually we only got drunk on Friday or Saturday. If we didn't work Saturday, we'd be drunk Friday. And if we were, you know, if we had to work Saturday morning, well, you didn't get drunk till Saturday, you know. And then we just got drunk. And we ruined all the holidays. I mean, that was part of the deal, you know. <laughs> yeah. Mother would prepare the turkeys, get everything ready. And Dad and I and my brother would be locked in the old Hikes Point bar over there, you know, because the old guy was kind. And what he would do at 10 o'clock in the morning, if you got there at 10 o'clock in the morning and started drinking with him, at 11 o'clock he'd lock the door. And between 11 and 2, it was free booze, you know, and we'd we just roll out there at two o'clock, man, not caring whether that turkey lived or not, you know, and uh, and we'd go home, screw up the holidays, is what we do, and that's what alcoholism does for families, you know, it messes it up. So I just did a lot of drinking, is what I did, and uh, it seemed like when I started drinking, things changed in my life, you know. Uh, prior to that, I wanted to be a, you know, a basketball star. I wasn't tall, I had a little problem there, you know, but but the reality is that I wanted to play round ball. I grew up in Kentucky, and that was one of the deals I wanted to do, is shoot hoops, you know, and I was a good hoop shooter, you know, I really was. But when I started drinking, I got into th more important things in life, like uh, hanging out and shooting pool and stealing hubcaps and doing uh, stealing gas and doing stuff that I hadn't done before. But it's uh, the group that I was drinking with, they were doing it. And, when, you know, if you hang out with them, you got to do it with them. And uh, so uh, I liked it is what I did. And I did that until I flunked out of school and got kicked out of school one more time. And uh, and I left home. You know, I left home uh, when I was 16 years old and uh, ran away to Florida and then I ran away to the Navy. And I just kept running away. You know, I don't know about you all, but when I drank, it was either a fight or flight, you know, and it was one or the other. And always one or the other was going on. And, and I had a whole list of reasons why that was happening in my life. You know, uh, if you had the parents I had, you would drink, too. If you had the dog I had, you'd drink, too. You know, it didn't make any difference. We will always find a reason to justify our behavior until you get here, you know. And then they sort of do away with that. They give you that. There are no more victims here. There's only volunteers, you know. And they, and they teach you about what your responsibility is and, and what you should do in a sober environment. And, and that was my trouble. I didn't know. I didn't have any tools to cope with sobriety. I really didn't. Just didn't know what to do. And I will also tell you that my brother grew up in that family and, uh, he don't drink today, and he just had never had a problem with it. My sister went to AA for about a year, and now she's, she don't have any problems today, and she doesn't go anymore. Every once in a while, she'll drink a beer. And, and But for me, and we all grew up in the same household, there was just something different for me, you know, and it was just something. And I, I could tell you that I could blame it on lots of people, places, and things, or the church, or God, and we hear all that stuff that we blame it on, you know, the punishing God deal. I really had a loving God, but later on he became punishing because I made him that way, you know. And so I'm here to tell you today that uh, 
that the God that I found in Alcoholics Anonymous loves me very much. But more important, he loves you more than he loves me. You know. And I know that today because that's the way it's supposed to work. And But I continue that relationship with him on a regular, regular basis. And it's probably the central factor in my life today is the God of my understanding. My drinking got worse and uh, found me an old girl in Oklahoma that loved me, you know. And uh, and the reason is nobody had ever said they loved me before. And she had two criteria. One is she said she loved me, and two, she had $4,000 in the bank, you know. And I was between love and money, you know, didn't have either, you know. And so we were, we corresponded for a while, and then we got together for a while, and then we got married. You know, and we had two kids by that relationship, and uh, she was coming from Oklahoma to Kentucky. I was finishing school up in Kentucky, and she said, you just pick out the church and the preacher. I said, all right. So me and my sister and I got drunk one afternoon, went looking for a preacher in a church, and uh, I married that old girl in the cemetery, you know. <laughs> There was a chapel in a cemetery, and this guy had all his family buried in this cemetery. And I just thought that was the coolest thing at all, you know. And, and I stood right there in the church, and his dead wife was buried in the floor, you know, in the, in the, in the chapel. And, and all I could think about is that dead woman standing underneath me, you know, <laughs> during that marriage. I, so it wasn't a marriage blessed, you know. Uh, she was a very religious lady, and she had to pray and save somebody, and by God, I needed it, you know. And so... Uh, but out of that relationship, we had two children. I have a daughter who's 30 and a son who's 34. And they're the love of my life, too. They don't love me as much as I love them some days, you know. But I will tell you, my daughter and I have a relationship today that's just awesome. We really do. Uh, she's gone through her deal in alcoholism, too. And, and she's got the point now where she gets sick every time she drinks, so she's quit drinking. Now, can you believe somebody actually do that? You know, I mean, you got to tough it up to go right on through that sickness stuff, you know. <laughs> sure would be an excuse for me. But her and I visit on a relationship that's not based on me being the father and her being the daughter. We're friends is what we are. And we correspond with each other and we love each other and we get together periodically. I don't agree with everything she does in her life. You know, she's doing some weird stuff on occasions, you know. But the bottom is that i got to give her the freedom to go do whatever she needs to do, you know. And I got to love her unconditionally because that's the way you all love me was unconditionally. And then I got a son who's 34, and uh, and uh, he's he's always been mad at me because I missed the soccer game when he was 12, you know. And and he's held on to that deep-seated resentment all these years. And I don't mean it was that soccer game. It was probably another one or something. But he's always been angry because I was never there for him when he was a kid. And I was drunk. I mean, I was drunk or gone or on a run or doing something. I just couldn't get there. I mean, you know, and it wasn't that I didn't want to be there. I mean, there was a sign of me. You know, we get to the alcoholic gets with the family, and they, the next day you always get is the next day. You never try to talk to us when we're drunk. You know, you wait till the next day, and then, you you know, we're sick and we're hungover, and you come in there, and by God, we'll promise you anything just to get some relief, you know. <laughs> You know, I'll go to church this time. I'm going to buy new wagons for the kids. I'm going to take them to the ball games. And you, the really sad reality is we really want to do that. We really want to do that. I mean, there's a side of us that really wants to do that for you all. But we drink. And when we drink, uh, uh, for some reason, those things no longer have a priority in our life. You know, our alcoholism kicks over. And, and the backside of that ism is the I and the self and the me, you know. And that's my problem. My illness is self-centered. My illness is, what about me? What about me? What about me? You know, I mean, it's always about me, you know. And you say, no, 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 no. You have to get into the fellowship where it's no longer about you. It's always about them. And it's always about God. And then you'll rank third. If you're a service to your fellow man and you're a service to God, then you can be in the third position and you'll live a pretty good life. And I don't know about you all, but that's so foreign concept from where I came from. You know, my concept was you win at all costs. You pull your bootstraps up your own. You don't put your laundry on the street. My God, you don't tell them how you feel, you know. And that's where most of us come from, you know. And uh, we just do that. You know, I had a father that uh, loved me, I think, dearly, but never could tell me he loved me dearly, you know. And I didn't get the blessing from him. We look for the blessing in lots of different places, you know. And we look for it in drugs and alcohol and sex and, and lots of places to get the blessing for us. And uh, and I don't know about you all, but most most boys want the blessing from their father, you know. And most girls want the blessing from their mother, 
They don't like their mother, but they want the blessing from their mother. Because usually the girls, their father lets them do what they want to do. And usually the boys, the mother lets them do what they want to do. My mother would love me until I died. And she almost did, you know, love me until I die. But I never did get that blessing from my earthly father until he was just ready to make his transition. And then I got that. And we were drinking buddies. I mean, we were good buddies and we drank together and we played together. He he was sort of, he was sort of a wuss. He didn't, couldn't hold out as long as I could. You know, I could go two or three days drunk and he could only go one and a half, you know, and then he'd have to go home because he's sick, you know. And, uh, and I'll never forget one time that we'd been drinking and I was in the apparel business at that time and we were down at the Dallas Apparel Mart. We were having a show down there. Now you gotta know that everybody in the apparel business drank. Or everybody that's a plumber drank, or everybody that's a truck driver drank, or you all have that say, everybody in my industry drank, you know. And I know today they really didn't. I just happened to hang out with the ones that did, you know, because I didn't want to hang out with the other people. And so we all get here thinking that our illness is centered in our jobs or our careers. And it got nothing to do with it. It's got to do with you drinking, you know. So we were down at the Apparel Mart. In order to get ready for the Apparel Mart and the big shows they have, you've got to get the showroom ready, and I had a showroom there. And we set it up, and we stocked the bar. Now, to stock the bar, you got to sample the whiskey in order to make sure it's good enough whiskey to serve to your customers. And so we, Dad and I had got into the whiskey bottle, and uh, we closed up the showroom that afternoon. I said, come on, I'll buy you a drink. We'll stop and have a drink on the way home. He said, i got to get home to Mother. She's cooking dinner tonight. And I said, well, we'll just stop and have one or two. How many times have we said that? We're all going to have one or two. Yeah. So we go to the bar, and we go to this place, one of the nicer places in Dallas. It's called uh, the Blue Stan's Blue Note Lounge. <laughs> you can tell it's nice just by the name, right? Blue Note Lounge, yeah. And we went into Stan's, and they have what they call matinees there. I don't know if you all ever drank at matinees, but they have a little band in the afternoon, and, and the housewives come to have the little band, and the salesmen go to dance with the little housewives, and then about 6 o'clock, if they haven't gotten together, they all go home to their respective parties, you know. And so we was at this matinee, and uh, Dad and I were drunk, and we were drinking fish bowls of beer with shots of whiskey in them. You know, we called them depth charges. And, and the objective is to chug that thing down and without the shot glass breaking your front teeth out you know and uh got to be quick to do that you know so we're in there drinking and dad said come on down i gotta go home i said i can't go home he said why can't you go home i said i'm in love now i always the third drink went right to my pants you know i mean it, it always did i don't know why you know and 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 it was i had no respect of race age or color it didn't make no difference you know i mean bottom line was i didn't care if they was old or young you know just for some reason that third drink just rocked around my pocket you know and and i told my dad i said i can't go he said why he said i'm in love he said with who i said that girl at the bar he said look at her and i turned around and looked up there and we'd been dancing and she'd gotten tired and she had her head down on the bar and was taking a little nap Now, it was back in the days where the ladies all wore wigs, you know. Some of y'all are too young to remember that, but there was a time where everybody had five or six wigs. And I guess it was a hot day, and and she had taken her wig off to air it out. So here's her hair on the bar. Here she is with this sock thing tucked on her head, taking a little nap. And my dad said, hell, she don't have no hair. I said, I love her. <laughs> now, I'd never met her before I went in there a couple hours earlier, you know. But it don't take long to fall in love. It really doesn't. <laughs> I went over and to tell her I'd be leaving, and she didn't move. And so I thought, well, maybe she's expired from natural causes. I better get out of here. So we left, and we got outside, and I got in my car, and he got in his car. He said, son, he said, you're too drunk to drive home. I'll follow you home in my car. But make sure you get there okay. <laughs> now that makes sense to the alcoholic. <laughs> he's drunk. I'm too drunk. He thinks I'm too drunk to drive, so he's going to fall. One drunk going to follow the other drunk home, make sure we got no problems. <laughs> and I said, Dad, I'm hungry. He said, hungry? He said, i got to go home and have dinner. He said, I don't want you coming home with me. He said, I, 
He, I said, let me pull over here to the chicken joint, and I'll buy me some chicken, and then we'll go on home. And he said, all right. So I pulled across the street over there, and there's a church's fried chicken. I don't know if y'all got churches out here in Montana or not, but church's fried chicken, you don't really have to chew it. It just sort of slides down. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's got that grease just hanging off of that deal. And, you just, and I went up to the little store there, and Sands Blue Note Lounge is not in a good neighborhood. It's on Maple Avenue in Dallas, and it's a pretty bad, it was a bad neighborhood before they had bad neighborhoods, you know. I mean, they had bars on the windows before people started putting them on their windows, you know. And I went up to this place, up to the church's deal, and, and you couldn't go inside and eat in this church's chicken because that was bad. I mean, they didn't let nobody in my neighborhood inside to eat. And you walked up to the window and it had a little podium, not podium, but it had a little, like a little, uh, shelf hanging out. You've seen them like on the Dairy Queens and they hang out. And I went up there to order. And I grabbed a hold of the shelf like this, and all of a sudden I had a major problem, you know. And when you've been drinking as much as I've been drinking that day, and you've been sort of floating all day long and dancing and falling in love, and you grab a hold of a stationary object, all of a sudden the object moves, you know. And that whole church's fried chicken place was moving up. And my goal in life was to hold it on the ground long enough to get my order in, you know. And... And that lady must have been a relative of mine because she sounded just like a relative of mine. She said, what do you want? <laughs> she could tell I've been drinking just a little bit. I said, what do you mean what I want? She said, what do you want? I said, hell, I want some chicken, you know. <laughs> and I thought that was a dumb question. You're standing there at the chicken joint. <laughs> She said, how much chicken do you want? I said, how much chicken do you got? <laughs> We're in a power struggle now. <laughs> and she is not going to beat me on this chicken deal. <laughs> she said, I got a family bucket that will feed 15. I said, by God, I want that big bucket. <laughs> she said, do you want mashed potatoes? I want mashed potatoes. I bought mashed potatoes. I bought corn. I bought. She was not going to beat me, you know. She said, how about peppers? I said, I like peppers. I don't even like peppers. But, you know, I couldn't let her know I didn't like peppers. And so I'm loading all this crap in my car, you know. And my dad's sitting in his car waiting to follow me home. And, and when you're, I don't know about you all, but if you drank like I did, you can stay in your car a long time, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you've got the proper tools, you're able to leave in your car for... So i got to set the picnic up. You know, I'm having this picnic, and I'm getting all the chicken laid out and all the corn laid out and all this. You know, and I had two cups of ice so I could put my whiskey on my ice, you know. And I'm just, you know, and I, in those days, they didn't have all these. I know who invented those little cup holders they hide all over the cars. Alcoholic. Some guy was alcoholic because he was tired of having those things. You used to have to hang on the side of the doors, and then you forget you're drunk, and you close the door, and it goes everywhere. <laughs> or some alcoholic in Detroit said, I'll fix that deal by a guy. <laughs> we'll just make him zip out of the dashboard. You know? <laughs> Yeah, we used to ask to buy those humper deals you put in the middle of the floor and the things you hang on each window. And when you drink like I did, you had a lot of them hanging all around the car. <laughs> so I'm drinking and got my picnic set up. Dad said, let's go on. I'm driving down the road, you know. And I, when I'm drunk, I only drive with one eye most of the time, you know. Because it keeps the vision better, you know. And I usually drive at two speeds when I'm drunk, 12 miles an hour or 100, you know. <laughs> and I sometimes can't tell which I'm doing. <laughs> you know. I mean, it's a hard task to drink and drunk and drive and keep a picnic going at the same time. <laughs> So I'm driving down the road, and all of a sudden I look up the road. My God, it's the biggest wreck you've ever seen in your life, you know. I mean, there were taillights, and it looked like, it looked like about 10, 18-wheel trucks that all crashed together, you know. And, and I thought, oh, my God, you know. Here I am, all this chicken and all this stuff, and got whiskey open in the car. And the judge told me that just last week, he said, if I see you again, you're not going to re get released this time. We're going to hold you. And I thought, my God, I know I'm going to pull up there. There's going to be flares. You know, they always put them out to slow down. You all have been there, right? And the fear just comes over you. And I thought, they're going to look in there and see all this chicken and this whiskey, and I'm going to go to jail one more time. You know, that judge is going to remember me from the last time. And 
And I was really worried, you know, I really was. And then as I got a little closer to the to the big wreck, it, it really wasn't a wreck after all. It was the Dallas North Tollway is what it was, and I'd seen all those lights on the toll booths up there, and, <laughs> and they just looked to me like a wreck, you know. And as they narrowed out, I pulled up through that toll gate, and I got there at the toll booth. My dad's behind me in his car going, <laughs> you know, move on. And I got up there and I had a problem. I had nice pants on like this and I had grease run down my elbows meeting that chicken. And it was 20 cents to go through the toll booth at that time. And I thought, hell, I ain't going to put my hands in my pockets and get 20 cents out. I'll just throw in a couple dollars worth of chicken, you know. <laughs> so I'm reaching in my bucket and I'm throwing this chicken in that big shooter. And I was, I'm a selective chicken thrower, you know. I throw wings and backs and stuff that I don't like, you know. Didn't throw no breasts and legs in there. I like breasts and legs. And my dad's sitting back there, and all of a sudden, you know, he sees that chicken flying out the window. And when I threw it a couple of dollars, I just went right on through. You know. Lights sort of went off, and, you know, all kinds of stuff was happening. And uh, my dad pulled off at the first exit and went home. We did. never did follow me home, you know. We didn't mention it for about two weeks, and one day I said, you didn't follow me home the other night when I was drunk. He said, that's right. I said, hell, I could have died. He said, that's right. <laughs> he said, when I saw that chicken coming out that window, I didn't want nothing to do with you. <laughs> we were speaking in, uh, in California. Karen just got back from the powwow, and she was there about 10 years ago. And uh, I just went out to carry her bags. I wasn't talking. And, uh, and I'm sitting on the front row listening to my bride. I mean, she gives a great pitch, you know. And I'm sitting on the front row listening to my bride. This guy's sitting next to me, and he wants to talk. He wants to talk while she's talking, you know, to me. And he says things like, give me this. He said, where are you from? I said, he said, where are you from? <laughs> I said, Texas. He said, oh, Texas. A couple minutes later, he says, I'm from Arkansas. I don't care. <laughs> and I said, good. I said, shh. He said, how long you been around the program? That's another one of those questions. And I went, shh. How long you been around the program? <laughs> and I said, not too long, you know. And he said, Texas. You're from Texas, huh? I, sh I said, I'm trying to listen to this lady up here talking. He said, have you ever heard a guy in Texas called the Chicken Man? <laughs> and I said, nope. <laughs> I wanted to be famous for something, but that wasn't it. <laughs> I spoke over at the Southeast Conference uh, a couple years, three or four years ago, and I was a Saturday night speaker, and, and uh, on Sunday morning I was sitting in the audience. I had a great speaker up there talking, and before they introduced him, the chairman called me up to the podium, you know, and they said, Don Maloney, I wasn't paying attention. Karen said, they're calling you. I said, for what? She said, I don't know. Did you forget something or what? I said, I don't know. And so I walked up there, and the guy gave me a bucket of church's fried chicken. <laughs> and my doctor had me on a vegetarian diet that year, and I thought, I'd suffer. So I sat there with that bucket of chicken underneath. We just wiped out about six rows, you know. But that's having fun in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. But it wasn't fun seemingly in back in those days. Uh, and my drinking just kept getting crazier and insane. And, you know, all of a sudden I was, uh, I used to be the rep that everybody wanted to hire. They said, get Maloney, get his group down there in Texas, and them boys sell more rags down there in the clothing business than anybody else. And then they would say things like, well, you know, he's, he used to have a pretty good sales force, you know, and uh, and it's not as good as it used to be. And then they'd say things like, we're not going to send him a line anymore. He drinks too much, you know, or he gets drunk at the wrong places. You know, you got to see what he told a customer. Yeah, and that story kept getting worse. And as it got worse, my drinking got worse because my income was getting worse. And all of a sudden, all that stuff got out of perspective. And I had no idea that my circumstances of life were tied to my behavior and drinking. And that's part of the problem of alcoholism. We're never able to relate our situation in drinking with our situation in life. We always think our situation in life is related to something else. Her, them, it, whatever. We always have excuses for that. Her no boy named one time he says, you know, he said, I never got in trouble every time I drank. He said, but every time I got in trouble, I was drinking. And I understood that.
I understood that. Because that was me. It seemed like every time I really got in trouble, I was drinking. And I didn't get in trouble every time. And when I would not get in trouble every time, I would hold on to those every time saying, see, I'm not alcoholic. I mean, I got by with it this time, you know. Up until the last couple of years of my drinking, and the last couple of years of my drinking, I couldn't get by with it at all. I mean, it beat me every time I went to the well. It just beat me. And I absolutely know that if I was going to take a drink, that my life would continue to get worse, and it would be worse than it was the time before. And without fail, for about two years, my life always got worse. It never got better. I could never go back and get that experience of back when booze seemingly worked for me. Now, through inventories and working the program and that kind of process, I found out that booze never worked for me at all. Never had worked for me. I just, it had the illusion that it worked for me and kept me in the game long enough in order to go back and drink one more time. It says we have to give up the obsession that we'll drink like normal people. I never wanted to drink like normal people. I didn't even like, and to this day, I don't like normal people, you know. I'd rather be with you, you know. We are all sort of wired backwards, you know. I mean, I think it's neat that we've been able to take most of the sick people and put them in one room. We don't have to look for them anymore, you know. <laughs> I don't know about you, but you'd have to go bar to bar to find a sick girl, you know, or the guys would do the same thing. Now we group them up together, you know. <laughs> They're all here. Don't have to look at all anymore. But I was sort of wired backwards, and I didn't have a clue what was going on in my life. Now, I knew my money was going away, because it was. And I knew my wife was going away because I didn't like her no more. That was my first marriage. And I knew the conditions of my life had become to the point where I couldn't stand them any longer. But I didn't know it was about my drinking. I thought drinking was the only thing I had left. I mean, I thought getting drunk was the only thing I, I had left. That was the only peace of mind that I had was to get myself drunk to the point where I didn't have to think about the rest of my life. Drunk to the point where I didn't have to worry or be consumed about all that stuff, being a father, being a husband, going to work. You know, when I was drunk, I was happy. I don't mean I was a happy drunk. I was happy because if you drank like me, towards the end of my drinking, I drank to get away from me. Didn't know that at the time. Don't know that I knew that until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. Or until we said that prayer, and we all have that one prayer at the end, and my prayer was simple. It just said, God help me. Didn't believe in God, but I said, God help me. Because I had got to the point where all my situations in my life had got to the point where I couldn't stand the high cost of low living anymore. I had despised the person that I had become. And I thought, whatever happened to that young, bright young man? that was on his way up the ladder of success. And we are able to do that for a while. When we're drinking early on, we're able to sort of drink our way up the ladder of success. And somehow or another, I heard Sandy Beach one time talk about it. He said, it's like riding a roller coaster. You know, we get on that roller coaster, and we're all excited about that roller coaster for the first time. Oh, I know it's going to be scary, but it's going to be fun, you know, and it's neat. And all of a sudden, you get in there, and that... Boom, the old track just grabs a hold of you, you know, and, and you're on your way and you go through a couple little curves, sort of gets you used to the deal. And then all of a sudden, something goes, boom, grabs you again. It's sort of like alcoholism and it clicks you and it's all of a sudden it's taking you up higher and higher and you're doing better and you're getting higher and you've got more stuff going for you. And then you see the sign. It says, please do not put your hands out and do not stand up. And you think, oh, hell. Something's about to happen. And you look around for a brief moment in your life, and you haven't got a choice. You can't get out of the car. You can't jump out of the car. You know that you're going to have to ride this deal out in order to get to the end of it. And that's alcoholism for me. When I crossed that line, when I could no longer blame anybody or anything for the conditions of my life, I had to ride it all the way out. And then when you get on the top of that little crest, you go down, and you're in for the ride of your life. And you will go down a lot quicker than it took you to go up. It's amazing how fast you go down the line. It's called alcoholism. It is not a wisdom. It's an ism disease. I will always have alcoholism. And I'm always in recovery. You know, I am not a recovered alcoholic. You know, you see that in the book. And when somebody wants to argue about it, you know, and I say, well, all I know is that by God, they keep printing stuff in my big book. You know, I don't know why, but every time I open up the big book, when one of them new drunks says, let's study the big book, you know, and I open it up and I went, oh, look at here. You know, and then they bring out new additions every once in a while just to confuse you, you know. But the real reality is that that big book is, you know, wasn't written that many years ago. 
And it is all, and it hadn't changed a whole lot. You know, the stories have changed, but the basic text, is, and when it says it is a basic text, that's what it is. And a textbook is not something you read anyways. A textbook is a purpose of a textbook is to study. And so that is our lesson plan for our life. And in the big book, it says what we have here is a design for living. And what I had was a design for destruction. And I was heading there just hell-bent for leather, you know, taking everybody with me that would go. You know, I don't care if it was wives or kids, mothers or fathers. You know, I would use you up quicker than anybody could ever think about using somebody up because it is the nature of my illness is to blame other people and use you up. So I don't have to look at myself. One day I woke up alone, you know, all alone one more time. And I had a mother that still loved me. My dad had told me, he said, son, you can't come back in our house anymore. I said, you mean when I'm drinking? He said, no, I mean ever. He said, you're starting to screw up my mother and your mother and I's relationship in, in our marriage is in jeopardy as a result of you being in our lives. And, and you're a grown man. He said, you're 33 years old, and we don't want you back in our house again. We don't need you in our life anymore. I said, I can't believe it. I said, you're my dad. You're my mother. We drink together. No more. We don't want to see you ever again. I don't know about you, but that was my last vestige of salvation. That was the last place that I could go back to and still know that they would take me in one more time and maybe help me get well one more time, to help me get my new start one more time. And all of a sudden that was cut off. And I used to go get a bottle of whiskey and I'd drive over in front of their house and I'd sit out there in front of their driveway and drink that whiskey and cry like a baby. Cry like a baby. And I would scream, how could you do this to me? How could you do this to me? After all, I am your son. How could you do this to me? We're sort of like the prodigal son, you know, who's been out running around doing all that stuff, living with the hogs, you know. Periodically, they'd bite you back and, you know, kill the new calf and set you down at the table and say, isn't this great? We're sure glad to have you back. And as soon as the dessert's over, you hear the hogs outside saying, come on back out here. we got some new slop to play in, you know. And then I'd run back out there and play in the slop one more time and give you all, called families, I'd give you false hope. I'd give mothers false hope. I'd give wives false hope. I'd give them all false hope. And I really wasn't lying. I, I wanted to be different. I really didn't want to be different. I just didn't know how. I mean, I just absolutely didn't know how. When they'd say, why do you do what you do? I ran out of reasons to tell you why I did what I did. I didn't know what. I just didn't know. I didn't know. I knew I was dying. Ended up living in a basement of a lake house up at Cedar Creek Lake, East Texas. And the, and the only person I had left in my life was Dutch. And Dutch was a white German shepherd. And Dutch would drink Jack Daniels and Coke and get drunk with me, you know. And so and Dutch would get on the juice and I'd get on the juice. And Dutch would talk about his problems and I'd talk about Dutch's problems. And we'd talk about my problems and Dutch talk about my problems. And we just, we really had an understanding. And I gave up eating. I don't know about you all, but I don't have time to eat when I'm drinking, you know. I mean, I might have a Coca-Cola every once in a while just to get a little sugar shot, but I don't, I'm not going to sit down and eat. No, I'm busy. I got things to do. Well, I hadn't been out of the house in months, you know, and I wasn't doing much. And my mother talked my dad into coming over there on Saturday, no, on Wednesdays between the hours of 12 and 1 and, and she would come in and clean me up and try to feed me some soup. And I know today that she did that to keep me alive. To keep me physically alive. And he would sit outside in the car and he wouldn't come in. And he'd watch his watch. And at the end of the hour, he'd honk his horn and it was her signal to come on out. And she said, son, I'm sorry, I gotta go now. And we did this for about two, three months. You know. She get me cleaned up just enough to live one more day. Live one more day. My dad and I, when he passed on, we healed up that relationship and we have, we had a great relationship in sobriety. He loved you people. I mean, he loved you people like you couldn't believe. He didn't like you the first year. And he didn't like you the first year because he had been standing by me all his life trying to get me to change. And then I went off with a bunch of strangers he didn't even know and got fixed. And he said, how can you go to them? You're not really an alcoholic, are you? Yeah. I said, you betcha, and I got to go, you know. And I learned that I had to go regardless. My sobriety had to come first in my life. If I was going to live and have any kind of existence, it would become first. And then after the first year in AA, when I had my first year birthday, I asked my dad, I said, would you come to my birthday? It's a big deal for me. And, and he said, I'd like to, 
I'd, I'd really like you to be there, you and mom, and my kids. And so my two kids and my mother and dad went to my first AA birthday. And we, in tradition, if you haven't been around long enough to celebrate a birthday, I said, it's really a big deal for us, especially your first year birthday, you know. And it's a really a big deal. And I celebrated my first birthday. And my dad, after the meeting was over, and he said, son, I love you. Whew, that's hard. He said, i tell you what I'm going to do. He said, if you can go a year without drinking, I'm going to quit drinking too. And my dad never took a drink again. Never took a drink again. And he'd been drunk every Friday or Saturday. As long as I can remember, he was Irish. And by God, that's what you did. You know? And he never took a drink again. And every year when I would get my chip, I'd give him my old chip. And he had his own big book. He didn't go to meetings, Alcoholics Anonymous, but he loved you people. He loved you people and loved that I was proud to be a part of you people. And when I buried him at 10 years, I buried him with my 10-year chip in a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because he loved the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. You had saved his son. You had saved his son. My mother's still alive. She's 92 years old. I hope I got her genes. You know. <laughs> She's living in a nursing home right now. We've been, we had mom and we call her Nana. We've had Nana in a nursing home for probably the last three and a half, four years because she couldn't take care of herself anymore. And somebody had to be with her most of the time to keep her from falling down the stairs or turning the stove on or doing all the stuff we get goofy over if we live long enough, you know. And we put her in that nursing home, and she got there pretty bright and played the piano for all the old people, she said, you know, and helped them out as much as she could. And then she has a thing called senile dementia, and it's gotten worse and worse to the point where there's no more mind left for her. Every once in a while, I'll get a little smile out of her, you know, or a little something, but it's the, it, it, they're getting fewer and far between. And when I'm in Texas, which I am some of the time, most of the time, but when I'm in Texas, I, I go to the nursing home every day. And I go there because I've got about eight or ten forgotten women that live there. And I go around and bathe them. And I go around and say, hi, darling, how are you today? You know, what's going on? And they have nobody's been to see them in two or three years. And I have a network of women that I go see when I'm in the nursing home. And they love me and I love me and I walk out of there and I don't have no problems. I mean, I, you think you got problems? Go down to the nursing home. Sit around for a day and be of service. I've sentenced a couple of my babies down there to play dominoes, you know. <laughs> I said, oh, don't tell me about that crap. Go on down to the nursing home and play dominoes for an hour and then come back and tell me about your problems. We ain't got no problem. We're sober members of Alcoholics Anonymous. We ain't got no problem. We're supposed to be dead. I will tell you that at 5 o'clock, I've had the privilege many, many days of going over and feeding my mother to keep her alive so she could live one more day. And that's a full circle for me in my life one more time. Now, I don't know why she don't go because she needs to go. I mean, physically, there's not much there. Mentally, there's not much there. But I do know that God knows. And I do know that when God is ready to receive one of the finest ragtime piano players in the world, he's going to call her. He's going to call her. And I know that for her. I really know that for her. So it gets harder as we make the journeys in life when we see the people that we lose. Or if you've been around here long enough, you're going to lose sponsors, and you're going to lose friends in AA, and you're going to lose. If we said to each other, let's all meet back here next year at this time, all of us, everybody, will everybody commit to do that? We all raise our hand. You couldn't get back, some of you. You just can't because you have a disease. And the disease is always going to tell you that you don't have a disease because the nature of the disease is I don't have a disease. There's nothing wrong with me. It's about you. That's the nature of our illness. You know, when we look in the big book, it says we think that our problems are centered where? In our mind. We think that our troubles of uh, who's making? Our own making. And so throughout that entire big book, it talks about the nature of your illness. And the nature of your illness is if you're like me, you're the most self-centered person in the world and you don't care anything about anybody but yourself. And your little king baby ego goes, I want what I want when I want it. You know, God says you'll get what you get when you get it. <laughs> Hardest thing I ever had to do is to learn to live sober. Don't know about you. Some of you may be trying it now. It's hard. I bounce through the doors, in and out, in and out, in and out. Old boy met me at the door one day, and he said, uh, I was bringing my jug back in. I had my jug with me. I surrendered. The last day I surrendered, I carried my jug with me, you know. God dragged me out of a bar, and we were there at the door, and he said, Maloney. said, you can't bring that jug in here. He said, we've been watching you. 
For two years now we've been watching you and we think we've got your problem figured out. I said, Psh, what is it? He said, sobriety. He said, you're having trouble with sobriety, aren't you? He said, I bet you don't like being sober. He said, I bet you don't like the responsibility of having to go to work every day, having a family, having to be responsible, having to be a child, having to be a parent. He said, if you're like me, I drank over those things. When I couldn't do them, I drank more. And he said, so I bet you probably like drinking. He said, in fact, we've been watching you, and we think that you've got getting drunk down any better than anybody we've seen for a couple of years. I don't think drinking's your problem. I think your problem's sobriety. He had me confused. <laughs> I mean, nobody had ever told me that before. They always said, by God, if you quit drinking, you know, if you just straighten up, if you just do right. I mean, they had all them lessons, but nobody ever said, man, you're really having trouble being staying sober, aren't you? I don't mean not drinking. I mean sobriety. And he was right. He had my deal. He said, you know, you can come in, but you can't bring that jug. I said, oh. I went down to the men's room with my jug, and I got in the last stall at the Preston Club in Dallas, Texas. And I got in the last stall in the men's room, and I sat down. Now, here's the disease of alcoholism. I went from a bright, brilliant young man with lots of potential and a college degree and making lots of money and had a family to living in the basement with a dog. And now, three months later, I'm surrendering one more time to Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know anybody that cares whether I live or die. And I'm sitting in the toilet, sucking on a bottle of whiskey, trying to decide if what you have is better than what I have. <laughs> Cunning, baffling disease. And it will take you to levels that you didn't even know you could get to. If you'll let it. And the sadness about our disease is when we get from this level to this level, we adjust and we move the mark one more level and say, if I ever get this bad, then I'm going to do something about my deal. And all of a sudden we're here and we move the mark. And you finally move the mark till you hit what we call the bottom. And when you reach the bottom, there's no place else to move the mark. And you either have to die. Well, the book gives you a couple of promises. You can be insane and be locked up for the rest of your life. You may die or you may get sober. Those are the options. And so I was faced with all those options. So I took another drink out of that bottle, hid it behind the toilet, just in case the meeting didn't take, you know. <laughs> Walked to my last meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous drunk. I don't know what they said that night. Doesn't make any difference what they said. But I knew an old boy took me home and put me on his couch. And he said, you're going to stay here for a few days. And then he had another two guys. They'd come in and talk to me in the middle of the night when I'd get up and be restless. And they held me down for about seven days. Because I was the kind of drunk, if you'd let me alone after drunk, I knew how to get better. And I'd go drink to get better. You know, They knew that about me. And that's how we did it in the old days. We didn't have any treatment centers to run off to. God, I would have loved it. Now, we get some good members out of treatment centers. So I'm not against treatment centers. We had... You know, for a while there, we went through a little dip, and we got lazy. We sort of said, well, I wonder when the bus is going to bring us more people to talk to, you know. And we quit 12-stepping, you know. And today I'm here to report that because of the lack of treatment facilities, because the insurance business has gotten out of the treatment business, we're back doing what we were intended to do, and that's to go out and talk to another alcoholic one-on-one -on -one and talk to him about how you stayed sober and share your experience, your strength, and hope, and you pass that on to somebody and say, come on, if you want to go with me, I can take you to a place where there's a lot of people just like me. And I'm loving 12-stepping again. My whole group's starting to go to jails again and hospitals again, and they're starting to do stuff we didn't do for a while. We got lazy for a while. Big Book says we rest on our laurels, and we did that. Glad to be back in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. It does indeed change it. At the 25th World Anniversary, and we've tried to change a lot. If you're in your first five years, you're going to change this program. If I got it kill you, you're going to rewrite the book, tell them they ain't doing it right, go start a group. You're going to, you're going to do all that stuff the first five years. Second five years, you sort of hang out. You get in the next five or ten years, you sort of hang out and wait for them to call you after they screw it up, you know. <laughs> And they will. They come around and say, could you come over and help? Say, yeah, okay. You know, and, but the reality is that we have to do what we have to do in order to have us all together. We can stay sober together and I get drunk. We stay sober. We can go through any problem in our life through the big book Alcoholics Anonymous and through a spiritual belief system, which I call God in my life. We can solve those problems with your help if we do it together. I could never do it on my own. 
I had to learn that life didn't work on my terms. Fourth year of sobriety, I had a big house, had a wife, had a car, had a boat, had a plane, had a, no plane, I had a lake house. I had lots of stuff. And if you looked at me on the outside, I got stuff. I mean, I'm, I've got stuff. I got more stuff than I've ever had. On the inside, I was dying. I was dying. I was behind in my mind. You ever been there? I had debts that couldn't pay. I had my businesses backing up on me, and I didn't want to give up the way I was living to have to adjust to the business community. So therefore, I started stealing from myself. I worked for myself, so I thought, hell, I can steal from myself. And if you steal from yourself long enough, you can't pay your bills. And I'd rather steal from myself and become a crook in my own mind and steal from myself than to have to say, come to you and say, I can't really afford that lake house anymore. I can't buy a new car this year. You see, because I had all this stuff that I thought you said to me was okay. And I had to learn it all had to go. I had five of my closest friends in Alcoholics Anonymous have an intervention on me in my fourth, fifth year. My sponsor couldn't be there, so he was on the speaker phone. And they all took a hit at me. And they said, we're concerned. We're concerned about your life. We're concerned about your marriage. And we're really concerned about your sobriety. We've watched you now for the last couple of years. And you've become so heavenly, you're of no earthly good to anybody. And that's true. You know, I ran out and got me a preacher's degree. And I was preaching and teaching and saving and doing all all the insane things we do because we we will go out and do anything that we'll, that we will do anything in an addictive behavior ma- ma- manner that will keep us from having to look at our own self we'd rather go out doing this than have to look here and that's what had happened to me one more time in my life and i woke up one day on thursday two o'clock I was broke bankrupt divorced my dad was dying of cancer and i don't know there must have been two or three other things going on and it seemed like it all happened Thursday, 2 o'clock. It all fell in at one time. Now, I know it didn't. It took time to get all that crap together, you know. But my sponsor said, well, son, he said, if all those things hadn't happened to you at one time, you probably wouldn't have listened. And I became teachable in sobriety. And teachable in sobriety meant for me that I had to learn how to live sober. And so we studied a book called The Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Can you believe that? We took it off the shelf. Instead of a big book, he had me buy a brand new one. And I had to start on the blank page because that's what I had to offer with nothing. <clears throat> and we studied, and he'd give me an assignment for the day. In the morning, I had to be there in the morning. He'd give me an assignment for the day. And it, anywhere in the big book, it would say alcohol, alcoholism. I'd have to cross it out and put SC and put my initials for self-centeredness, Don Maloney. And I had to learn that the nature of my illness is that I am self-centered to the max. And I always want my things first, my needs first then I have to put your needs in front of mine in order to live in a sane recovery manner. I was sentenced to one year in Alcoholics Anonymous without saying anything, except for my name, my sobriety name. I was sentenced to one year in Alcoholics Anonymous without dating. I always had them have me a trophy, you know. Long year not to date and talk, you know. And I remember about three months into the no talking deal, I slipped off to Waco, Texas one day. Had to go there. I knew there was a new meeting. I went over to the new meeting. They hadn't seen me in a while. They called on me in the new meeting. I shared 20 minutes with them. <laughs> I mean, when you got all this knowledge and wisdom, you can't keep it pent up, you know. I got home 5.30 that afternoon. I walked in that afternoon. My sponsor, he looked at me and he said, I hear we've been talking today. <laughs> Hotline. I don't know why those sponsors, how they do that, but they do that. I survived that year, and Karen told you we met each other in a street dance, and we've had a great relationship. We've learned how to stay married together. My sponsor said to me, he said, son, do you really want to stay married this time? I said, I really do, Bob. He said, well, a couple things you got to do. I said, what's that? He said, you need to act like you're married. He said, I've been watching you. Most of the time, you don't act like you're married. Married people act different than single people, and you need to start acting like you're married. I said, oh. He said, you know, you'll never know the benefits of a long-term relationship until you've been in a relationship long-term. <laughs> I said, oh. He gives me those simple answers. I walked in there one day and I said, life just screwed up, Bob. i got more problems I can deal with. He said, you like fudge? I said, fudge? 
He said, do you like fudge? I said, yeah, I like fudge. I said, yo, man, you, ain't, you don't even hear what I'm telling you. He said, fudge. I want to know if you like fudge. I like fudge. He said, when you was a kid, your mother ever make you fudge? I said, yeah. He said, how did she do it? Did you get to lick the bowl with a spoon? I said, I got the spoon. My brother got the bowl. I was mad at that. Didn't know I was mad at that. He got the bowl. I got the spoon. He said, you remember when that fudge would be on top and they'd be cooking that fudge? You remember how they do it? I said, yeah. They put it on the fire after they stir and it starts bubbling. He said, that's like your life. He said, you love fudge so much, you put it on the fire, and what you do is turn the fire up and watch it boil. And then it goes, bloop, and all of a sudden, bloop, and as it cooks, it goes, bloop, 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 bloop. And you got 12 things going wrong in your life all at one time. Because when your plate gets full, the first thing you do is you go out and find another plate to put stuff on. You never take care of what's in front of you. You go out and find more to put on your plate. He said, you don't know how to have a relationship with anybody. He said, we've tried you with a dog and we've tried you with a plant. You know. <laughs> I still have a dog. I went there one day and I said to Bob, I said, we've been married about it. I don't know, it hadn't been long. I said, Bob, this marriage ain't going to work. He said, why not? I said, I thought you was going to stay married this time. He said, no. He said, well, maybe you get divorced and you'll be all right. He said, you're a pretty good looking guy and you make a living and you'll find a new girl in AA. Don't worry about it. We always do. You know, maybe she is a heroin addict this time, you know, instead of Al Anon. <laughs> maybe she shoot a little dope in front of you and steal your whole house, you know, and, you know, he said, you, you'll be lucky like that. He said, you probably do for one anyways. And, you know, I'm, I'm hearing all, he said, he said, I thought you said you want to stay to marry. I said, we do, but we, we never agree on anything. He said, you willing to go to any lengths? I said, I'm willing to go to any lengths. He said, go home and you and her start making the bed together in the morning. I said, what? He said, y'all have to start making the bed together. I said, hell, I don't make beds. He said, you're getting ready to start. You know. He said, Marceline and I have been making the bed together every morning for the last 43 years. And we absolutely have to agree on how that bed's made before we leave in the morning. Or we can't leave in the morning. And so we at least agree on one thing before we all leave to go to work in our respective places. He said, now you and Karen happen to work together. So I went home, and there was Karen sitting at the door, and she knew I'd gone to see him because I told her, I said, she said, why don't you see your sponsor? I said, by God, I am. <laughs> now I will tell you that most guy sponsors like the girls better than they do the guys, you know. I knew he liked her better. I really did. She'd do things like bring him buttermilk and, you know, and she, he just liked her, liked her a lot better. And I went to him and she said, what did he say? She's standing at the door. She's got the, she told you about that al stance when they put the two hands here and they take their foot and kick it up here. <laughs> it is. And they, they're able to stand in that position for hours, hours. <laughs> I call it the flamingo stance. Is what I call it. <laughs> and she said, what did he say? What did he say? I said, he said we have to make the bed together. She said, oh, bullshit. What did he say? <laughs> so I dialed 694-3604, and I said, Karen, I said, Bob, hold on. I'm going to talk to Karen. And I hear her going, okay, Bob. <laughs> make the bed? Yes, we'll make the bed, Bob. Okay, Bob. <laughs> If you're not making the bed together with your significant other, try it. It's a real challenge. <laughs> we took a long time to agree on how to just tuck them pillows in right and get the right tucks on it. I mean, you know, I mean, it took a lot of skill. Two weeks into the bed making, I get up one morning, she wasn't acting right, doing something wrong. I said, I'm out of here. She said, you haven't made the bed yet. I said, I am not making the bed today. She said, Bob, say, I said, I don't care what that old man said. I am not making the damn bed. She said, you'll have the worst day of your life. I said, so who cares? And I left, slammed the door, and I absolutely had the worst day of my life. I, <laughs> I had three or four real estate deals. Must have cost me $8,000 that day. They just blam, blam. Everyone just kept falling apart, you know. And I went home, and I said, God, let's go make that bed, <laughs> you know. <laughs> now, I don't know why making the bed works. But I know when I don't make the bed, it don't work. And see, that's sort of what we learn, Alcoholics Anonymous. We don't have to know why it works. When Bill Wilson at the 25th World Conference, a guy went up to Bill Wilson and said, Bill, how does this thing really work? And he said, just fine. 
And that's how Alcoholics Anonymous works, just fine. It doesn't need you tweaking it and changing it. It works just fine. It works just fine. We've been married now, and we'll be married 21 years pretty soon. You know, I got married. We got married on her birthday. I gave her 200 pounds of pure darling for her birthday. You know. Yeah. And if I and if I ever forget that August 15th date, I'm in trouble. I've missed her birthday and our anniversary all at the same time. We have a good relationship today. I'm not going to tell you we haven't had some ups and downs in the relationship because life goes on. You know, kids do things and parents do things and you have problems and you got money and you got, you know, all kinds of, and life goes on in sobriety. The difference today is that I have never had to drink in almost 28 years now over of any of those problems that come along in my life. And they come along. They still come along. But they're able to, we're able to deal with them in a manner today in sobriety that we never did before because those are the tools that you gave me in Alcoholics Anonymous. And a lot of them you gave me out of my own desperation because I couldn't stand my life even in sobriety based on my terms. Even in sobriety. I went to a meeting early on and uh, and an old man was standing at the door and he said, uh, son, didn't like that. He said, you better keep coming back here. I said, why? He said, because this is where the magic is. And I've come to believe in 28 years that the magic is still alive in Alcoholics Anonymous. And the magic not only happens for me, but more important, I've come to believe that it happens for you because I never am able to see it happening for me. I have no insight into who I am without you. And that's why we will always need each other. And the magic is to see Clee with three months, and to see Eddie come back again with a year and a half. And, and it goes on and it goes on. And that's the magic in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's never in my recovery, but it's in your recovery. And that's what keeps us coming back to Alcoholics Anonymous is we need to come see what's going on. And in turn, we get a great way to live. It's God-centered instead of self-centered. And we're able to help our fellow man and do whatever we do, whether it be in business or whether it be in AA or whether it be in service work, whatever the case may be. Bob White, my sponsor, at the, I think it was the first Canyon Conference, maybe the second Canyon Conference. It was the first one, maybe. I don't know. He was asked to come up and speak. And he didn't know he was dying of cancer, didn't know he had cancer. He spoke up there in the fall and and he found out he had cancer shortly thereafter and called his A-team together. We had eight of us in his A-team. He said, boys, he said, uh, I'm going to die of cancer. Sounds like to me. So I got melanoma and spread, and he says, I'm going to die of cancer. And I, I need to tell you, all eight of you, that uh, I'm okay with it going on. He said, I've left a good legacy in you eight guys. He said, I need to tell you that it's going to take eight of you to do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's what sponsors do. They give you a little humility on these. <laughs> but at that Canyon Conference, and then he repeated it again at Laity Lodge, almost dead at that time, a couple months later. He said, in a few moments, we're going to close this meeting with the Lord's Prayer. He said, it's a prayer we say at a lot of meetings. He said, I've been in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous for a long time, and I can't tell you how many times that I've said the Lord's Prayer. And tonight we're going to close the meeting with the Lord's Prayer. This afternoon we're going to close the meeting with the Lord's Prayer. He said, but I've been thinking on that prayer. And he said, you know, it's, it talks about our Father, and I've always wanted the blessing from our Father. And he says, so if there's a Father, and it also talks in a little bit in there about the kingdom, so he may be a king as far as we know. And if there is our Father and there is a kingdom, and in fact, he, we ask for our daily bread one day at a time. He said, I believe probably what, what we need to do then is lift ourselves up to the point where we can become the prince and the princesses of the kingdom. Because if we do say there's a Father and we're part of the kingdom, he said, you owe it to yourself to get your just due. And part of your just due is to become the prince of the kingdom and the princess of the kingdom. And he said, but we need to start acting that way. And we don't do that in all areas of our lives. 
But we have the opportunity to do that in all areas of our lives because the program of alcoholics not. He said, so when we close this prayer this evening or this afternoon, instead of saying the prayer, he said, why don't you try praying the prayer and listen to the word? And he says, and then you will finally have learned about the prayer itself. Because it reflects our life in Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're new here and you haven't experienced the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous, stay with us. Stay with us. you got nowhere else to go anyway. I can tell you, you don't, but stay with us. If you're old here and you've been here a long time, we need you worse than we've ever needed you. Get involved in your group again. Do a study group. Help them other guys. You're not worth this anymore. You're not bored anymore. You don't have to be old and alcoholics. Now I'm sort of fall by the wayside. We need you. We need you to stay. Don't leave until the magic happens. For you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.